Uh, my name is Harlan Steinberger, and I'm director of Hen House Studios here in uh, Venice, California. Hen House Studios started about six years ago, and it's an independent record label and DVD production company. Everything we do is music based. Uh, the way it first started was we wanted to build a small sound stage, which is where we are today, where you could actually record music and film it at the same time. And then we invited musicians in and we, we, we told them that they could record for free in exchange for the right for us to film them. So in the end, we would own the rights to the music only as it related to the footage. And then they could take the music home and do whatever they wanted with it, which for us was great. We took the footage and we made documentary films from it. Some, you know, we made one big film with 50 bands in it. And then we made some other films, like we, like we had a band here that we really liked. And we kept them here for a little bit longer. And we filmed the, their creative process. And then we go outside the studios and interview them. And then from that idea, we started realizing we were ending up with all these great tracks that we didn't own the right to release because they were made into our footage. So then we went back to the artist and the label was born. And we started licensing back the songs without the image and started releasing compilation records and then started making full length albums and then people's you know the word kind of got out that we you know once people realized the fidelity was decent enough then people started calling and it's not really it's never been a studio for hire and uh, we've done some stuff like we'll help out other documentary filmmakers because documentary filmmaking is, is mainly a labor of love there's very few films that make money so we'll, uh, we all, we'll open our studio up really cheap for people who need to do some documentary film work but other than that we basically produce everything that we release here and uh, it's been it's been really fun we've been having a really good time and for us um, really what's made all this possible is the internet uh, yeah, I had a, a hen house used to be called Stone Mountain Entertainment before that and we had distribution through a, a formal distributor a really good distributor Koch and we realized then that this whole model of you know sending your CDs out and and you know going in a truck and going to the stores was really something that was going going to die out and, and for me it also it, you know, it's it's a bad analogy, but it, it seemed like a bad drug deal. Not that I'm into drugs or anything. It's like, you know, when, when, when I, I know when people sell drugs, they always go through a, a different hands, and, you know, people take their cut, and by the time you get paid, the, you end up with hardly anything. And that's sort of what happened with the physical distribution that I noticed. It's like the distributor would get paid, and then they, you know, sometimes we would be, um, there'd be a sub-distributor, so maybe two people would get paid, and then we would get paid, and then we would pay the artist. So by the time we got paid, and the artist got paid, a long time had gone by, and then funny things would happen with the money. And with the internet, the accounting is instantaneous. I mean, you sell... When we sell a CD, we get an email five seconds later letting us know that we sold a CD. If we want to know what's going on as far as accounting, you don't have to go out and hire a fancy accountant. You can just, they allow, the really good websites that sell stuff have back-end accounting where you can sign in and see who bought it, what their name are, what, you know, what, their, what, their na what their names are, what their email addresses are, what countries they're from, you know, sometimes phone numbers, though we don't call anybody. But you get all this information, and then plus... We finally got commerce on our site about four years ago, and people buy from our site, and it's all set up the same way. So it's, I mean, the Internet has been, I think, one of the best things for people. Um, it's been really bad for the big labels, but the thing that they don't ever talk about for the mom-and-pop labels like us, it's been fantastic. It's allowed us to compete on, on at a, a, almost the same level. I mean, they still have more money for marketing and things like that but as far as availability our records are just as available as theirs and you know we had one dvd movie that was in tower records and then now tower records went under which already is just you know for us i mean it hurt us a little bit but not really you know it's totally in lines with uh what what we want to be about which is you know all just a digital based company we market through radio you still um, there's some newer companies now where they'll send all your music out electronically, which I think is a great thing, and I don't really know if it's a successful way to market your music because you, it's it's nice for for a label because then there's no postage, you know, and then you know the the costs go way down. But I don't know how receptive yet the CMJ, the College Music Journal's affiliated radio stations, which is where we primarily market to, be, and AAA, which is more of the you know NPR type stations. So to go after the big commercial stations, there's still this. There's payola is supposedly illegal, but you have to pay about eighty thousand dollars a month in fees to a radio promoter to get your to get a song like you know a big top ten hit. It's really 
So for an independent label, we go after the CMJ stations and the AAA stations, and we, we mail. We mail our CDs out, and then we send out emails, and we call. So that's, you know, we do, we sometimes will hire an outside promoter to do that, a radio promoter, and sometimes we do it in-house. It just depends on the music and the project. You know, our anthologies we tend to, to do ourselves because it's a really good opportunity to let some of the musicians who are all playing on the record to come into our offices and, and make the phone calls, and they're actually promoting themselves, which is a, you know, if you're going to sell something, if you believe in the product, it's really, you know, best best way to sell things. And then with more special specialized records, one artist albums, then often we'll hire an outside uh, radio promoter that does everything for us and we pay a monthly fee. But it's really important to try to get your stuff to radio, for sure. Publishing, I mean, advice, first advice, and you know, because people call me all the time, you know, my son or you know, young daughter wants to get into music, and the first thing I tell them is to write. Um, because the way that things are going with the music business, and it's always been this way, but it's even more important now, the writers are the ones that are going to be able to possibly make a living in the long run. If you're a player of music, which is an admirable, great thing, you know, and not a writer, you're going to get paid to play if you're good. But, you know, 25 years from now, you're not going to make any money. If you're a writer and you have a song that does well, now, 25 years from now, it, it, could, it could have a, um, you know, a, a, it could be reborn and it could get played again or somebody could re-record it or somebody could put it in a movie, you know, and there you are. You could be an old person and you're still making money off your music. So I think publishing is, is re it's really important for musicians now to really take writing very seriously if you really want to try to have a career. So for us, it's like, what's happened with us is like, we have a huge catalog of masters and, and the only, you know, sometimes we have publishing in, you know, because I'll actually collaborate with other writers, but now we're starting to sign artists because people have come to me, you know, asking to license songs like Nickelodeon has come to us. There's a major motion picture that's coming out this this summer that we licensed some songs to. So people are coming to it, to me and I was I re, well, was already acting as an unofficial publisher and I was noticing that you know all the other songs some of these people are these these um, t television stations and movie companies are using are official publishers and here I am in that mix. I was like, okay, I'm acting like a publisher, so I really it's time for us to get it together. So we got it together and now we're we have our publishing company set up and we have artists, and we have songs so I can go out and push songs and and uh, it's a, it's been a really nice way to, you know, for, a, a real nice income for our label. We don't take any publishing. We're taking the sync right, which is, you know, it's like it's a, it's a certain form of authorship, but it's only affiliated with the vo footage we shot. So they could, like, if we, you know, release that song with that footage in a movie, if they want to sell it to a commercial, that same song, they can. It's a non-exclusive sync right. So, yeah, it's about going back to the artist and reestablishing deals. And the way I was doing it before, it was like I'd get a call, I'd start sending out music to music publishers or people would discover us online, which which, which is what happened with this uh, major motion picture that we're going to be in. And they would, you know, I would, I would say, sure, and I'd, let me just check with the artist. I'd say, hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, it looks like I'm going to be able to place this song. Are you into it? And, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And this is the terms that I think are fair. And everyone says, yes, of course, you know, let's do it, you know. And you're still going to get your publishing side. And then and then we'd get the agreements and we'd, you know, I'd sign as the master owner. They'd sign as the, as the writer and we'd split the money. So, But now I, it's more official. So I can go and make those deals without having to make that phone call. Like they're trusting me and understand that legally that this is what I'm, contractually, this is what I'm going to do. I don't think anyone is doing what we're doing. You're getting content for nothing. Yeah. Well, in the end, we owned all this audiovisual mated content. You know, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of it. And it's all well organized and edited. And it's 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 what's happened. It, it and we don't we don't make we don't really make much money off that at all. Really, any money. But what it, it does, it's all up on our website. There's gigs and gigs and gigs of video information up on our website. So if people come and if you're interested in an artist, you can see what they're like and at the same time there's there's a good chance that there might be something for sale of that artist that you can buy on the website so it's almost like a way to get people to come to our website and people have discovered that that there's this huge you know vast you know a bank of uh, video information really fun and unique stuff they're not like 
music videos in the MTV sense, they have a documentary type quality. They're informative. You can musicians really love them because they can see, oh, look what kind of guitar he's playing, and oh, look look at the process they're going to to create this song. You can actually watch the creative process happen, and you can learn how what studios are like, and it's fun. We get a lot of musicians in here who've never been in studios before. And the thing that's beautiful about our model is, and I realized this you know, early on, is like when there's, when there's initially no monetary commitment in, in, in the creative process, you tend to get the best and most beautiful performances. And as a producer, that's your job, is to make everybody feel comfortable so you get the best performances, right? So if somebody's here recording and I'm not paying them to be here and they're not paying me to be here, and I constantly remind them of that, everything starts to get real loose and real comfortable and then you end up getting these really beautiful performances. So it's, that, and that's really fun, and that's really rewarding. And then the hard part after that is try to figure out how to make money. And after that, you know. The project of recording bands for free feeds the label, essentially, because we'll, we'll discover artists that way that we want to make records with, or we'll, they'll record three songs, and we'll say, we really like this one song, we want to license it for a compilation, and then, mm -hmm. and then it's for sale. And then, you know, and they're, they're built into that, that structure, that sales structure, they'll get paid if the songs sell. They, they get their mechanicals and all that other stuff because we've separated that song and then we make a separate deal. But we'll get in bands in here where we like their music but we don't really think it's right for us. You know, everyone we record we like but we don't think it's right for the label. So, but we'll still do it because we like to have, you know, a good variety of, of video information. So that's how it sort of feeds. And then that process also too feeds documentary films. So you know and that we use, that we that we make, and that's another source of revenue. All all our films and music is available. Well, at first, the the very beginning, um, the the main videographer here, he was a young guy and he liked going out, and so we actually hired him to go out to clubs and find bands. That's what we did at first, and that was very short lived, because what would happen is a band would come in, they'd you know hopefully had a good experience. I think most bands did. A lot of bands that came here was their first time ever in a studio, which to me is a great. Thing, a great way to, to be broken into the studio experiences because like my first studio experience I was really nervous the producer was really intense and you know and it wasn't such a great thing and it, it, it scarred me for a short time but in this experience it's like the expectation is very very low for, as far as you know what we expect you to be able to do and so you come in here it's really comfortable and so that's been really great so we send this guy out he you know he's, he'd find bands and you know in all it, once people realized that the place was cool and that there, there wasn't any built-in scheme to try to rip you off and stuff like that, and enough people were doing it, and the fidelity was decent enough, then he no longer needed to go out. And like the way it would work, we'd have to be careful. Like let's say he'd go out to Orange County and, and find a, like a reggae ska band, and they came and had a good experience. The next thing you know, we've got 10, 15 reggae ska bands where all their friends are all on the same scene calling us wanting to come in, and we'd do like two or three of them, and we'd have to say, you know, we don't want to be the reggae ska you know handhouse studios you know and then and then it'd be like you know we do an art band from silver lake and then the same thing would happen you know the, we our criterion for choosing bands were was that there had to be artistry in our opinion um, we didn't really care so much about chops and ability we just had to feel like there was artistry involved in the music and then we didn't want any slanderous lyrics we didn't want to offend anybody lyrically and then other than that it was open season. Any we've done jazz, we've done classical, hip hop, rock, pop rock, you know, um, speed metal, emo pop. I mean everything. And you know, and another thing about this experience too that it was actually a, a friend of mine who sort of pointed this out to me, and it's really true for me. It was a little bit like going to grad school, like getting my doctorate, because it's you know if you're a producer or an engineer, I mean. Unless you, well, engineers, I guess, they will probably work more than producers. But, you know, producers, they don't get to record that huge of a variety of bands every year. I mean, if you're, if you're a happening producer, if you do three or four records a year, that's a lot, you know. And we were doing, like, you know, we, had, we did 100 bands. We were doing so, 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 such a high variety of, of music in such a short time. And I was getting the experience of working with hundreds of musicians, hundreds of different personalities, and I was honing my chops as a producer, and I was honing my chops as, as an engineer in a really fast way. A little bit was like, for me, like going to school. You know, I got, I got a lot of experience, really. Not that I didn't have that much experience, but I got a lot of experience in a very condensed period of time, which is really starting to help me out right now. I really feel like 
I, I feel confident that I can get the job done because I have so much experience just from that, from the hen house experience, you know, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can tell you what's coming up. I, can, I know exactly what's coming up. I, I feel like I know what the next hotbed of music, what the style is going to be and where it's coming from for L.A. I think I have a really good idea what it is. The URL is www.henhousestudios.com. There's contact information on the website, or you can info, info at henhousestudios.com or harlan, H-A-R-L-A-N, at henhousestudios.com. That's all, it's plural, it's henhouse studios. The way that we distribute our music on our site, we're probably, I haven't counted in a while, but at least 50 different sites. Um, lately, we found out the best way to, to do it is to try to drive people to your own site for obvious reasons, you know, financial reasons. There's no one else takes a cut, you know. But... Um, we're on, we're on, you name it, we're on CD Baby, we're on iTunes, we're, you know, I think Tower Records went and gone under, but there's like, I don't even know how many, I mean, all in, in Europe, and, and we're now we're on some site in Russia that's selling our stuff, and so it's like, it's pretty endless, I mean, there's some, like, the two good companies, as far as getting quick uh, internet, you know, reach, uh, is uh, CD Baby, and uh, the East Coast because there's an East Coast company, The Orchard. Those, if you know, if you want to just hit two sites, because what they do, they have tons of sub-distributor websites that they're already affiliated, affiliated with, iTunes and, and so on. So if you just hit those two sites, within six months, your, C, your CD, your music will be available on probably 25 sites. I mean, that's how easy. And I think they charge like $35 right now or something like that. So for like 70 bucks, the two different sites for one record, you, you, you know, that doesn't mean you're, you know, you'll have a good reach, but that doesn't mean your music is going to sell. You still have to, you know, go out and play and promote. To me, I think that still the best way to sell records is to go and play. You got, you know, you can sell records on shows, and you know, maybe you'll play a show and no one will show up, but your your name will get in the paper. And that's something that people have to, you know, musicians always forget. Oh, no one came to our show. What a waste of time. But you were probably listed in, you know, in the L.A. Weekly, for example, in the you know, Los Angeles, you know, local paper. People read that and they'll see the name, and then if you play again somewhere else, so. There's, there's, it's really important to get out and play. I mean, that, and that we've had the most success selling records with bands that play, for sure. I started out as a drummer and a writer, and I'd be in touring bands and, you know, you know, played in Europe and doing sessions and stuff. And then I um, started producing some of the records of the bands that I, that I was in. And then I got asked to produce the band that was on the, the second episode of The Real World in Venice. California, and then that's when I started learning about documentary film, and, and filming musicians and filming people. We were recording in the studio, and they were filming us, and I was, you know, taking notes and stuff and checking it out, and and then I made a concept record. Uh, it was called The Spirit of Venice, which was the best of the boardwalk musicians from Venice Beach, like 15 years ago, and it got released uh, through Capitol, and some Italian filmmakers came up to me and said they wanted to make a documentary film based on this record and they wanted me to help them interview. I acted as the interviewee. I interviewed everybody for, you know, as they were filming them. The movie never got released. The guys ran off the footage. I don't know what happened. Harry Perry though, right? Yeah, Harry Perry was in it for sure. I'll give you that copy of that record. So, it, yeah. so that's how I learned, you know, that was a, another introduction to the whole documentary side. I thought, oh, I could do this, you know, and it doesn't seem that hard. I, I found out it's very hard, but, uh, you know. I mean, for me, it's, it's it, for me personally. It's always felt like the business side of, of 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 life was easier for me than the music side. I always felt like oh, being a businessman is simple. Being a good musician is really hard. So it's uh, it's definitely important. I think the especially now because it's so much about independency within within the industry. I mean, I like there uh, uh, one artist here, a woman named Aya Peer. She got signed from the Hen House. They saw her video on the hen house warner brothers signed her they saw they heard her music on the website and they came in here and they swooped her away and signed her and two years later she opted out because she realized that she was much better as an independent artist than she was being with someone like warner so i think that if you're going to be that's great but if you're going to be that independent artist which it seems like that's who you need to be now you have to understand how business works you know and the people who are talented and understand how the business works are the ones that are going to be successful. If you're talented, you're super talented, you're going to, yeah, you'll be successful and you could hook up with a major label and they'll take care of all your business and you're going to, you know, but I mean, if you look at it, how many musicians now does Warner have really on its roster? 20? You know, that they're really paying attention to? 
So those odds, it used to be that they used to sign a lot more artists, but everyone's trimmed down their, oster, their rosters because the business's model has changed. So there's a lot of bands that are doing well on their own, mm -hmm. but that's because they understand what, how to market themselves, how to take care of their business, you know, what, 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 does, what is a mechanical license. They understand all that stuff. So I think, yeah, it's, it's really, really, really important. And the beautiful thing is that because the Internet, again, if, you, if there's some information you want, it's right there at your disposal. You can go just click in mechanical license into Google and you'll figure out what it is real quickly. So it's very important, yeah. Um, starting Internet label, uh, I think the first thing you have to do is go out and get you get a URL go get a, a web address you know go you can go to uh, there's different websites that do that what's the biggest one that there's register.com is one of them you can go there and, and you know think of a name then you want to trademark your name too as well and that's something you can do online you can download the form and send it in you don't really need an attorney to do that and I don't really know what I can't remember what the fees are for that but those are the first two things. You want to establish your web presence and you want to legally trademark your name so that you know, if you spend all this time and energy and, and probably money on something that no one's going to call you, you know, half a year later and saying, hey, I already have this name. You know, and you, you, know, you have to change your name. And that, in a way, it's like starting over. So I think that's the, the most important thing is to establish your identity and do it in a way where you can feel comfortable that you own it, especially if you're going to be looking for outside money. I mean, if somebody invests money in you and you find out you, don't, you didn't really own your name, I mean, it's really, it's, you're going to look pretty stupid and the investors are going to be really mad. So I think the first thing you need to do is to establish your identity. And then the second thing that you need to do is, you know, start recording bands and start releasing records. You know, um, you know, it's real. You know, it's pretty simple. You know, on your website, get commerce on your website so you can sell from your website. You know, and then also make your your records available through these other organizations like the Orchard and CD Baby. That's it. I mean, it's really not that complicated. And then the marketing part, you know, that's cost money but you know you can hire publicists we've done that before in the radio promotion or you can do it yourself you know you can try to gather start uh, my theory as in business is always start small and you know the seed being just the trademarking of your name and, and take you know small steps and have it evolve in a way that's organic rather than you know if you have some money to spend don't start too big slow you know slowly build it up and have it make sense otherwise you know you're going to expand too quickly. And that's like the, one of the main reasons businesses fail is because they spent too much too fast or they expanded too quickly. Just start small and let it grow. There's nine of us. There's nine of us. And it, it's pretty job specific. There's like an engineer, a videographer, there's a graphic artist, there's a couple office people. And then there's, you know, there's independent contractors too that we use a lot. You know, there's, you know, graphic, well, um, some of the um, webmasters tend to be independent contractors. Webmasters are a finicky type is what I'm finding you know it's we've been through a few only because I and I finally realized what it is it's like m sometimes your ideas aren't realistic you know and then you're asking them to do stuff and they're not doing it for you and it's I should say it's not realistic for them they don't know how to do it you know sometimes it's not even realistic at all it can't be done but a lot of times in webmasters are not quick to admit that they don't know how to do something you know and they'll take months trying to figure it out and meanwhile you're getting bummed out so we intend to go through a lot of webmasters but, yeah, there's just different people that do different things, you know. I mean, we're also always in the different process of doing stuff. I mean, and when we're ready to master a record, you know, we use an independent master mastering guy. So, but there, there's about nine of us who are full-time and then expands, you know, from there. You know, I'd like to make more records. I mean, the you know, since we've produced all the records that we've made, you know, the, the thing I'm finding now is that I would want to release more records every year. But we can't make as many records as we can, you know, would like to, to you know, because I think for any company to be successful, you have to constantly be growing it. You know, you have to do more every year than you did the year before. So now we're looking at actually trying to license masters or buy finished records and have those being our catalog and DVDs. I'm looking at some, some movies now, too, that we, you know, we might outright, out, outright buy or license and put those in our catalog and then continue making stuff as well so we can, you know, we can expand our catalog at a faster rate because that's one of the things that I'm, I've always been told but we're finally starting to see it it's like you know if you have one record especially with the internet and if, if you have a hundred records I mean you're gonna sell stuff every day if you have a hundred records if you have one record you probably won't sell stuff every day it's just the quantity of tracks available increases the chances that you're gonna have a sale 
granted the music has to be of a certain quality or a certain desirability but building a catalog it's like it's a lot like having an art collection in a way you know and so sort of like what we're doing we're trying to collect and create that's what really would like the future just to, to to be to build our catalog up and then of course to to continue recording bands for free and to be able to offer that service which is there's a there's a little bit of um I don't know philanthropy is the right word built into that idea because we really we really feel like we're doing something that's really benefiting musicians and the whole music community by giving people a chance to to be in a recording studio and walk out with something that's going to sound better than what you could make at home. You know, a lot of musicians are making records at home I and mean, we have proper isolation and usually pretty good mics and stuff like that. So and then you know, and then uh, there's always also the identity of Hen House. I would like more people just to under you know understand the you know the great thing about the coolest labels that I've always liked is like if it was a label that if, that you really liked, you bought the record because it was that label's new release, not because the, you know of the artist. You just wanted everything. If it was sub pop, if you were a sub pop you know label fan, you wanted the next sub pop record because you loved that label. So that's something I'd like to try to you know build on the brand identity of, of the Hen House. You know. When I was really young, somebody said this to me, like, don't go into the music business unless it's like life or death, you know, I mean, meaning if you can't see yourself doing anything else in your life, then don't bother. So am I happy? <laughs> yeah, I'm super happy because there's nothing else I'd rather be doing. You know, I mean, I can't see myself doing anything else, you know. You know, this, this I was been thinking about this lately because of the whole greenhouse effect and energy and the whole thing. It's like, what would you do? If there was no power, there were no batteries, there was no electricity, what would you do? You know, I know what I would do. I would be a hand drummer. You know, it's, that's what I would do. It's obvious. I would be in music no matter what, no matter what time it was, you know. So it's like on the, on the you know, the root level, it's pretty much who I am. I mean, you know, what, whether I, if, if all of a sudden I couldn't turn on the computer and use the microphones and turn on the lights and do everything that we do here, I would still be doing music you know so yeah it's it's not a choice really if it's never been a choice for me it's, it's what I have have to do it's you know so yeah I'm very happy that I'm able to do it I feel really lucky because I you know I'd probably go nuts if I couldn't you know so you know the way I look at it is you're gonna have to pay for promotion one way or another and um, if you're gonna you know monetarily so either you're gonna pay a promoter or you're gonna pay a publicist or you know you, you know whoever you're gonna need to pay to help you know you're gonna have to buy you know some ads in magazines or whatever you're gonna need to do if somebody starts to steal your music from the internet and it becomes really popular that way to me that's just another way of paying for publicity um, if people care enough about your music to make copies of it and legally download it, you know, and you're an independent artist, that's a, I look at that as a really good, positive thing. I don't encourage people to do that, and I don't encourage people to do that with our music, but if that happens, that means we're doing something right, and I, won't, I don't go out of my way to try to stop people from doing you know, If an artist is upset about it, yeah, then we'll, we will do whatever we can. I mean, there's really not much you can do, but... I think it's a really good thing. Now, unfortunately, for the for the for the artists who are really well established and who you know have had catalogs around for a really long time, if people are stealing from them, it's they don't need that. Mm -hmm. It's actually taking from them because they're you know they're already know, you know their catalogs are already established enough where they were selling fine. They didn't really they didn't even need to promote anymore. You know, and some of the big more established bands like the band that's the one that started the Sue Napster. I mean, their their catalog was doing great with with them just sitting in their living rooms watching TV, you know. But for a younger band coming up, if people start, you know, I encourage people to give their music away. It's really a great way to if you don't have any money to pay for promotion, just give your music away. You know, if you make an album, give away a couple songs. You know, free downloads for your music. It's yeah, yeah. You know, let people record your shows. I mean, look what it did for the Grateful Dead. They were the most successful touring act in the history of music and they let people bootleg their shows so they made more money on the road than anybody so I mean how bad of an idea was that you know? Oh, mm -hmm. it bother me. <laughs>